Nikki Bomber on the line. Nikki, hi. Uh, hello. Thank you, Rusty. <laughs> it sure is. Now, it sounds like you're, <laughs> you're moving and on the road somewhere. Are you going home? Are you going to I'm, a gig? What's happening? I'm, yeah, I am. Well, I've just returned from a little gig in Maroochador. Uh, so I flew down. Um, well, I flew up the other day, and, and uh, we actually had two gigs, but we had to blow one out because of, um, of COVID. Um, and when they said you couldn't dance, we went, well, we're not going to have that. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just postpone. Um, and so Maroochador was a green zone, so that was okay. But when I flew back, I uh, had a bit of a, a kerfuffle with the, the airport because according to the, um, uh, the permit application, because I live in a certain zone, I didn't need a permit. And they said, no, they practically accosted me. And I went, look, let's go through the process together. And as it turns out, I was right. Hey. I had the, the, uh, the proper scar, scar information. <laughs> I said, uh, and as it turns out, the guy was Maltese and, and, he, and he'd seen the Melbourne Scar Orchestra before. So, so we were on the same side by the time I left. <laughs> of course. The Nicky Bomber charm. <laughs> now, listen. Let's talk about the Melbourne. Sc <laughs> let's talk about the Melbourne Scar Orchestra uh, briefly. Uh, how did it all begin? When did you oh. get together? How do you suddenly accumulate like twenty plus musicians? Yeah. Well, it all really started in two thousand and three, when that was kind of officially or unofficially the fortieth anniversary of Scar, because in nineteen sixty three. Uh, My Boy Lollipop was released by Billy, Billy Small, and it, it was a massive hit worldwide. Uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers released Simmer Down, and that was a hit in Jamaica. And it was a time when that genre, that particular sound, that signature, um, you know, uh, groove, you know, showed its its, its true colours, you know, so, uh, and, and became successful. So... It's always been, 63 has always been a, a town of this as the year of, of Scar, which is also the year I was born, so it uh, worked out perfect for me. So, uh, 2003, we wanted to do a 40-year tribute. So we just put the word out to all the Scar bands and reggae bands in Melbourne. Uh, we put a bit of a set list together, and we were inundated with the response. Um, we, we put the gig on the Gershwin. We had one little rehearsal. And it was completely sold out. We turned away about 300 people, and we thought, "Wow, that was that was good fun. We should do that again." Uh, and then we did it every year, kind of for about three or four years. Um, did a couple of Christmas shows, and um, and then, well, that's when we, we that's when our connection with you started, because we got. Uh, I, I mean, I was trying to play blues fest for a while, blues fest, and then. Got the, got the call from Peter. And bingo. And, that, and that's it. Exactly. I mean, well, yeah, well, well what, what happened then really was we were still pretty much a tribute band then. So we played all the classic UK specials, the, uh, you know, the Madness songs. And we also played the early ska, the, the early Jamaican ska. Um, and... So we kind of started dabbling in our own music, but we certainly didn't play many of that, much of that stuff live. And we always had special guests on stage. So our first Blues Fest was massive. It was fantastic. The, the work got out pretty quickly. We did a couple of shows. And in the audience was a, um, an A&R guy from a label called 4-4, which was connected with ABC. And he saw us and loved it and said, look, you know, do you want to record an album? You know, maybe we can have a conversation. And we said, yeah, we'd love to, but we don't want to do a cover album. We want to do our own originals. And so in the ensuing weeks, we had conversations. We played him a couple of things. And he went, okay, let's do it. Let's do the first Melbourne Sky Orchestra debut original album. So we pretty much had an idea of what type of songs we wanted to do because we used the, the kind of the tribute set list as our reference, so we wrote a Perfidia, we wrote a My Boy Lollipop, we wrote a a, uh, a Cumbia, and so it was really kind of, as a songwriter, having a bit of a brief and having a reference was, was really easy. So we recorded it, and um, 
you know, we've, we've recorded seven albums with them, with them ever since until, until this time, until 2020. Yeah, uh, but the, the first album came out in uh, 12, 13, 2013, wasn't it? That was the, the, That's the, correct. the first one that came out. But as you say, you've been prolific since. You even did... Um, uh, you even did that one one track per week and turned out four albums in a year. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> let, let's make a, uh, I'll make a suggestion to any musicians that are listening at the moment, do not try this at home. Because <laughs> we did, and we just survived. So we recorded a song a week for a whole year. Yeah. And so we broke it up into batches of 13. The first thing, 13 was Scar Classics, songs that turned us on our own renditions of that. The next 13 were TV and movie themes, which is a very uh, popular tradition in the ska genre. And then the last 26 were completely original. And some of them were writing, like, literally on the spot, finishing them the night before they had to go out. And that's when it got crazy. Yeah. That's when catering went out the window <laughs> and uh, the 7-Eleven across the road was a was a regular horn for their dollar coffees. <laughs> well, how do you pull so many members into the studio like once a week for a year? How do you possibly do that? Who was the tour manager? Well, <laughs> well, no, we had we had we had to do a serious, disciplined military style roster, and we had to stick to it. Otherwise, we were Keystone cops. So. Um, and, and it worked. The first there was a, there was the first couple of days of, of adjustment and, and the first couple of weeks, but then we kind of got into a good role where, you know, as soon as the other song finished, the next day we were into what we had on the plate, what we had to develop, who was coming in, horn sections coming in and doubling up with as soon as they finished. You know, we did keyboard overdubs and vocal overdubs, and then we had to mix it, master it. Uh, but it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a love for the music in the first place, because 25, 26 people in the band, it's not going to be a financial adventure. So if there's got to be love, positive energy, and a lot of fun. And, um, and, uh, and, and it, was, it was there in droves. And I just fed off on that. And, and, you know, it was after it, we were exhausted, but we said it was, you know, one of the most enjoyable things we had ever done. Uh, but not that we do it again in a hurry. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic, and we and we won an aria for it. I was about to say, and it gave you an aria too, which is a fabulous achievement. It did. Fabulous it, achievement. It was, I mean, it was it was very well deserved, but we were very honoured to get it. It was our, our second one. Um, we, we 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 received one for our our second album, which was Sierra Keeler Alpha, and uh, so we're pretty lucky. To have to a band with you know thirty odd members, uh, which we, we wouldn't think even you know would see the light of day, you know to have seven albums and tour the world and, and two arias. So there, there, there's a lot to be proud of. That's right. Now I want to take you just back to the first. You know you about what you you told us about how you sort of worked the the, the later albums, but when you got to do the first one. Uh, how how did that process work? I mean, I know you've been in recording studios and all you guys have uh, and girls have been in sessions and things like that. But uh, was it was it a long drawn out recording session that you did for the, your first album? Well, uh, I've been used to producing a lot of albums, and, and I, I I had to do a lot of work with. Uh, I was the executive producer of a. Uh, a musical association in Victoria called uh, MAV, uh, Multicultural Arts Victoria. And a lot of the, those recordings were of big Sudanese choirs, of uh, community bands that had to come together. And, and you know, we, had, we spent a day recording three or four songs and a day we'd bring food. And, and it was very much, you have to be very coordinated and your times have to, have to be right on. So I kind of learned a lot of lessons about making sure that everybody was disciplined and got there on time, did the homework, all the charts were ready. Um, so I learned from that. I knew that preparation was key. And so I adopted it pretty much straight up with the, uh, when we did the first album. It was a beautiful space we were able to record. 
which was also a space that we rehearsed in, so familiar to us. And that was at Adelphia Studios in, um, in, in Collingwood, which is which Fitzroy, which is no longer there, but it was a beautiful space. And it reminded me of Studio One in Jamaica, and it had that sound. So we set up in a, in a big semicircle. Uh, we got a great engineer in. Uh, we did some test recordings the night before. And we pretty much recorded that live. And we went for that vintage live recording. Uh, and you can hear the difference between the first album and the second album. Because the second album we recorded in the studio, but we wanted it to be a little bit punchier and, and, and a bit more kind of modern anyway. But the first album was very much that old sound. And it still stands the test of time. It still has a beautiful sound about it. Yeah. Um, so when we actually did the, when we did the recording, the, the most difficult thing was the coordination of who's doing solos, who's singing what, flying down, how steel pan player from Brisbane. Um, that first blues press recording too, the significant um, story around that too was, was actually when we met Pat Powell. Because Pat Powell was one of the drivers that would drive the musicians to and forth the stage and to and from the stage. And we met him, heard him sing, and he told us he'd been playing ska all his life in Sydney and had club ska and being, you know, fish from Jamaica. And we pretty much hired him to join the band on the spot. So the next time we played Blues Fest, he was in the band. So we had to fly him down too for the recording. Um, and so, you know, accommodation for everybody, that was a big thing. Uh, I wasn't living in town at the time, I had to find somewhere. So it, it worked out really well. Everybody did their homework. Charts were, were, were printed properly. Um, we made a lot of stuff up on the spot, but the band knows we work that way. You know, we are very spontaneous and very much like, you know, we work with broad strokes, you know. That's not working, this is ditch that and work on something straight away. And, and, and I had to have my, my shit about me as far as being a strong captain. And if something wasn't working, not spending too much time in it and ditching it and moving on. Uh, and I love doing that. I love working kind of in blocks that way. Um, so it was great. It was really good. And, and, and I was thrilled that, you know, in, in a week or so, we'd recorded, you know, well in excess of 25 songs. Wow. That was great. And, and, and still, uh, some of those are, are staples in your live performance, like... The Get Smart theme, Ligon Street Meltdown, He's a Tripper, The Best tripper. Things The Best Things in Life are Free. We, you, and, and you, you pretty much nailed Theme at the Mexico. You've nailed some of the showstoppers that yeah. we still do live because of the request of the band. I mean, our, our most viewed um, YouTube clip is Get Smart because we made a little film clip with it. And that's over six million hits now. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so, and exactly right. Those songs, they're, they're well written songs. And, and we're lucky, you know, that, that, that um, we're also very lucky that the album won a really steady award in the UK of all the bands that, you know, an Australian reggae band that wouldn't do a Scar band with that. And also, they made a documentary of Scar in the UK by UK directors. And they used three of our songs in that film. I mean, we were so chuffed, you know, we just so, we kind of, we feel like we've done the homework, we've fired the flag, we've given it integrity, and we've given it the love and the, and the respect that it deserved, and, and it, it, it's, it's um, come back tenfold. And, you know, it's, it pays. Uh, and I've always been a big believer in that, you know, if you get something the right intention, and yeah. you, uh, you, you know, you, you, you boy it with joy, and you have a good attitude with it. You know, if it's, it's, um, you don't expect anything back. And so when things come back, it, it's magnificent. You know, and, and um, it's, it's been part of the drive of the band, that, that essence of, of uh, celebrating that genre because of how it's made us feel. Oh, uh, look, and it's I very think very universal. And, and that comes across on stage uh, as well with the, your live performances, which. You could never say a boring, uh, I mean, you, you are totally as visual as you are musical. Well, uh, it's, 
it's funny you say that because I never get a chance to see what's happening behind me. It's not just there to front and kind of we coordinate stuff and you know I make shit happen and you know it's all good. But so the only time I really get to see what's going on is when I get to see a video of the band. And one of the first ones I saw was the one from the first test, and I was blown away. It was just like, oh my god, look at all the stuff that's happening behind me. You know, ball players doing their thing, guys running back and forth. There's there's kind of you know. Um, banter and stuff happening between you know, the keyboard player and the horn players. And it's like, wow, I would like to see that show. You know, yeah. That would be a good thing. So, um, and you've, but you've got to kind of come up with new things now and again and put a couple of new things up our sleeve. If you can't be seen to do the same, same stuff over again. But there's also a, um, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater either. So some showstoppers have to stay because they work and people love them and they want to see them again. Much like if James Brown didn't do his splits or he didn't do his hit songs, people would be disappointed. Absolutely. And listen, um, I know by experience because you dragged me on stage one year. I remember that well. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm glad we didn't get an invoice because I wasn't going to pay you anyway. No, uh, of course. But it was, re <laughs> it was really cool to stand center stage with you uh, and hear the orchestra just yeah. pumping through your ears. I mean, it was such a buzz. And, and is, that, is that a beautiful, that a beautiful energy when you, oh. you see it? And when you look at the crowd, they are beaming, they are smiling, it is joyous, it's an adventure. And I feed off on that as much as they feed off on us. It's very much a, an electrical loop that I try to, um, I try to, you know, set up as soon as I can. It's not much just about treating the crowd as an entity and having a conversation with them. And, I, you know, the more I do it, the better I get at it. But I still respect that that that, um, that sacred space, you know, being on stage. And I, I don't take it for granted, you know. So it was a, um, uh, you know, try to keep on our toes with that type of thing. Yeah, and, and you, uh, I mean, forget about little old me, but you've also had our festival director, Peter Noble, come up and share the vocals on uh, Message to You, Rudy, one year, if I re complete, complete with at, the pork at, pie hat. At the same, yeah, the pork pie hat, and also a couple of dance moves, and also ranking Roger, bless his soul. Um, he got up with us as well, and Neville Staples. Yeah. Um, so we were, we're, we've, been pri we've been privileged with the orchestra to get the support. I mean, some people like Peter anyway, but even from foundation performers. We've had I've had Stranger Cole in my studio recording a song with the orchestra. We did Run Joe with him. We've had Carlos Malcolm, the horn arranger that did all the uh, Doctor No arrangements for James Bond films. Um, we've done stuff with Owen Gray, who was a pioneer performer, one of the early um, early uh, reggae Jamaican singers from the 1960s. So we've, we've, we've had the accolades. We've had David Wakeling from British Pete, you know, um, giving us big ups and, and uh, a, you know, a nice connection with him. So um, we're lucky. We're lucky that that's, we've hit on something right and we've had enough love from uh, punters, from festival coordinators and from the, our peers to keep the whole thing afloat, you know. And I don't take it lightly. It, it, it's a... Um, I feel the respect, respect there. It's, it's, um, it's a good well, feeling. Well, Nikki, thank you, because I can he hear you uh, moving along the road there. Thank you for, for explaining that on your I love, debut I love album. Conversa yeah. I love conversations that go for more than 35 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you keep watching the road. But, th but thank you for that. But I also yeah, okay. want to sort of... Depends, depends, depends. I, I just depends on how fast you're traveling, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. But I just want to—I yeah, right, yeah, just yeah. want to finish by saying, look, you've got a, an incredible eclectic bunch of musicians that that come and go as their availability allows. But always at Blues Fest, you have like the maximum number almost possible. It's it's, it's a wonderful sight to see the orchestra in in full gung ho mode on full our stage. Flight. 
But come on, yeah. spill the beans. What are a yeah. couple of crazy facts or a couple of things that we don't know about the Melbourne Star uh, Orchestra? Who's the, for instance, okay. who's, well, the, who's the youngest person that's ever played with you? Oh, uh, well, I mean, well, first of all, the, the oldest person is about 73, Rob Calvert, and we always celebrate his age on stage. Um, the youngest my permanent member is 22, that's Jess. But we have had a, a young player, his name is Josh. He played, he's 13 years old, and he's learned five or six of the tunes. He's rolled up in his complete uh, Scar outfit and pretty much just asked us if he could play with us. And we went, well, if you don't have Gus the song, and you do play it well, um, which he did, I said, you're there. And so his mum brings him to... Every time we play Wednesday, he pretty much joins us for five or six songs. Awesome. So that, that's one set of gaps. Another set of, set of guys is um, that our biggest expense when we're recording the album is the fucking catering bill. <laughs> <laughs> right. we, once, we once rolled up to an airport with two one-ton high ace vans to fit 35, no, sorry, 25 people and all their gear. And we just laughed. <laughs> That's a couple of no. couple of big vans, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's you guys uh, on the road. Doing, we're actually doing... Take it, totally. Um, <laughs> with, uh, our worst, our, our biggest kind of worst nightmare was the Gladstone, Gladstonebury Festival, where... The festival was so gig, it's like seven festivals in one. And to get from one festival site internally to another, it's like you have to go to another country and get passports and wristbands and everything. And there was one time when we had to do two shows in a day, and they were only literally two kilometres apart. But And we had three hours to get from one stage to another. But they were so disorganised, we didn't make it. We ended up... Half the band straggled on doing half a set with half the band, and we and we got there halfway through the set because it was well not only being a mud fest and we had to carry all the instruments through the mud, but it was kind of the gig you had, the gig you had to play doesn't look good on the resume, but the glad to me um, festival was a complete mud shuffle, but still. Lots of lots of lots of uh, lots of good stories, and we ended up doing half a gig, and uh, uh, it was a big adventure. Yeah. And when we finished, we all had Wellingtons. We realised we couldn't take them on the plane, but so our, our, our parting picture was a mountain of Wellingtons available to anyone that wanted them at the fest at the festival um, exit. <laughs> well, hey, listen, if you do have that picture. If you do have that picture, or one of the guys still has that picture, could you please email it Wally, to me? Wally would probably have it. <laughs> we got lots of pictures. Don't yeah, because I'd love a picture of the mountain of uh, Wellies at Glastonbury. I think that's uh, Wellington. It's so I, indicative. I think I took one myself. I just have one. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't find them Great. while you're moving. All right. Just don't worry about it. But no, Nick, no, but, no. Don't do that. But Nikki, thank you, thank you for taking the time and taking half an hour out of your journey to uh, to talk to us um, and uh, and spill the beans on your debut album and all your other albums and what might be coming up at Bluesfest this year. Yes, yeah, well, I believe we we, we might we, well we recorded the live album last year. We should we got nominated for an Aria for that too, but we're working on some new material. I'm, I'm doing a solo album this year, but uh, we're also going to be dropping in some some, some album stuff, orchestra stuff too. So, um, and collaborations, have to be doing a couple of those. But lovely to talk to you, Rusty, and um, looking forward big time to the Moose Fest. It's it's, it's my, you know it's a big 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 on my calendar. It's close to my heart, and um, it was really an indication that we were doing something right when we got asked to play the festival. So. Um, but hats off to you guys for, for keeping on doing it for this year when it's been so difficult for some of